remember Meister Eckhart uh, and his statement that the soul grows by not by addition but by subtraction. And the whole idea that we're trying to get across here, and I hope you're into the flow of it because it's almost unexplainable, that it really is, spiritual growth really is a process of growing down. Um, I talk to professional groups sometimes, many of, of whom are not recovered people, and uh, uh, give them a pitch about how abstinence is the essence of recovery. You know, you abstain from whatever drug it is or whatever addiction it is that, that's got hold of you, but that the quintessence, the pure form of recovery, always and ever is spiritual growth. And that you cannot maintain abstinence without growing spiritually, and you can't grow spiritually without abstaining. And so those things are intimately connected in this growth process, this business of growing down, if you will. And a lot of the growing down has to do with what William James called deflation of the ego. Uh, some people balk when you say deflate ego. That, they almost equate that word with annihilate ego, you know, uh, destroy ego. Uh, we're talking about, okay, let me put it this way, and Little Red Hen which is the way I understand these things best. There is in me, there was and there probably always will be, a little spoiled brat that lives right inside of me, about eight fingers above my mouth, okay? He sits in his high chair, and he beats on it with a spoon. <laughs> and he says, do it, and do it now, and do it my way, or I will retaliate. Now, we are talking about, in recovery, if you will, turning the brat into a child who is simply sitting in his chair. Not directing things, but living his life calmly and quietly, and allowing those around him to do likewise. So we're talking about getting healthy here. We're not talking about killing the kid. That's, that's a big jump. We're not talking about that. But in a certain sense, the kid dies. The kid dies. Any person who recovers has to sacrifice. And sacrifices are, that's a nice word, I guess, for deaths. You know? There's giving up to do here. And some of the things that accompanied, you know, my addiction, my drinking problem, uh, my inability to abstain, were some of these things were very precious to me. You see? Some of these things were very precious. And you have to die to those things. There is no spiritual growth, I don't believe, without a death. Seems to me for rebirth to occur, you know, there's got to be some demise somewhere. And with most of us, it's like the influence of the spoiled brat is reduced little by little, and the little kid begins to increase more and more. So it's like a balancing kind of a thing, if that makes any sense at all, okay? A balancing, a bringing down. The word anonymity, do you know the root of that word any Greek scholars in here? I hope not. Any Greeks. I, I use Greek words sometimes. I had a student in the class one day that was a Greek, and she said, you're wrong, and she had to straighten me out. Anonymous. Anonymity, says the 12th tradition, is the spiritual foundation of all our traditions, ever reminding us to place principles before personalities. Anonymity is the greatest ego deflator on the face of the earth. That's what it's for. It says when we're outside that door out there, we're many different people, many different statuses, if you will, as society has us in, these levels of society, whatever they may be. But when we walk through that door, titles disappear. Educational status disappears. Uh, male and female even, ideally, disappear. Uh, particular religious beliefs which we honor among each other, are left outside that door. And we come in here equal. Okay? We come in here equal. Anonymity, okay? Means I'm no better than you. I'm no worse than you. In the truest sense, I am you. What happens to you happens to me. What happens to me happens to you. 
It is the greatest bonding mechanism on the face of the earth. And we read through those 12 traditions and we read about anonymity and, and many of us consider anonymity like a band-aid, you know, a protective covering that you put over a sore called alcoholism or addiction or of some kind. It's not. It's a leveler. It's an ego deflator. If you will take the time someday to look at all of the 12 traditions, please, from an ego deflation standpoint, you're going to see what the 12 traditions are really for. All of those 12 traditions are saying individual, reduce the ego. Fellowship, keep the ego reduced, or we will destroy one another. It's a very important kind of a process. It really is. So we're trying to take the spoon from the spoiled brat and saying, hey, kid, we love you. You know, don't tell us what to do. Settle down a little bit. And the irony of spiritual growth is that only the kid can grow that way. Only the brat can lay down his spoon. I can take it away from him, but he'll pick it up again as soon as he gets a chance. Only the brat can lay down his spoon. Now, each of us in this process of growing down are uh, carrying with us a certain attitude, a certain outlook on life. Did you know there's an addictive outlook? I believe that there is. I sit down with people, uh, one gentleman was mentioned he was bulimic. I, I'm alcoholic, but I bet that he and I could sit down and talk in terms of attitudes and outlook and outlook. I right on. We're right on. I found my uh, uh, de de in alcohol, this, okay, this particular tour in, in food and in binging on it, okay? We carry with us a certain outlook, and we come in the world with the outlook. Now, we're talking about get getting back to where we were to begin with, okay? Through a process of called rebirth, along with regeneration being made all over again. That's the process of growing down. Rebirthing, going all over again. Each of us deals with this thing right here. You ever stop and ask yourself, what is reality? It's a wonderful word, isn't it? We use it all the time, don't we? Daily. I love Lily Tomlin's comedy, okay? You know her character, the bag lady? Bag lady shuffling along. She knows what reality is. She turns to the audience and says, reality is a collective hunch. <laughs> and if they tell me if you get too close to it, you get all stressed out. It upsets you. I like that. A friend of mine who's a marvelous doctor, spiritual doctor out in California. Reality, he says, is a, is, is a uh, or we all live according to our own personal myth, he says. And if enough people agree on it, we call it reality. That's Paul Brenner. If you ever get a chance to, to read any of his stuff, uh, uh, one book he wrote called Life is a Shared Creation. Another one that he wrote, uh, Health is a Question of Balance, in which he says mind-boggling things like, isn't it a shame that we never notice we have a thumb until we jam it in the door? <laughs> He's a nutty doctor. He's brilliant. Absolute genius. To hear him talk is a gas, I'll tell you. Okay? And uh, he became anonymous. He was the head of female cancer service at a very large university and got bored with it and started treating people uh, with prayer and meditation. He'll spend a day or two or three days with one patient. Okay? Somebody tell me what reality is. Anybody? Nobody wants to tell me what reality is. Am I going to have to go home not knowing what reality is? <laughs> Patty, tell me what reality is. Okay. I think it's I think it's the way things really are, not the way I want to see them. 
the way things really are and not the way you want to see them. Yeah. We what? Did everybody hear that? You know, back when I was in school, uh, I, I, they taught me grammar. They always trained my left brain. Did you notice that? Oh, well, my left brain really got it. Logic, grammar, arithmetic, all this kind of stuff. Reality is a subject, and is is a verb. Remember what kind of verb that is? Small English lesson here. Huh? Huh? They used to call it, they call it a linking verb now, don't they? The verb to be. And after a linking verb comes a word that describes the subject. Hmm? Yeah. Okay? Reality is now. You said you make your own reality. I agree. I agree. I fill in this blank. I could go around this room and take a secret poll, write on a piece of paper what reality is. Everybody here would have an opinion about what reality is, and some of them would miss each other by miles, and some of them would come very close together. And if we got into certain aspects of reality, they'd start coming even closer together until we got the addictive view of reality. But just for now, let's say this. Reality is for me what I see it to be. I agree with you. Reality is for me what I see it to be. I behave according to what I see, don't you? And reality, or my view of it, and my behavior are intimately connected. Example, this is a bad world. I was, <laughs> I was doing a group up in Asheville, North Carolina. You ever see one of these, there's not one here, I'll make sure before I say it. One of these little old ladies, and they're cute, and they got blue hair. <laughs> You know how, how they, they put that stuff on their hair and they get it all blue and everything. She's the prettiest little thing you ever saw. Absolutely denied she was an addiction. She'd been on an addict. She'd been on Valium for 23 years, right? She could not be addicted to it because it was prescribed by her doctor. Okay, one of those. Bless her heart, I hope she's still alive. And I asked her, what is reality? And her response was, do you really want me to tell you? I said, yes, ma'am, I do. Are you sure? Yes, I do. Are you really sure you want me to tell? I almost had to pull it out. Yes, I want to hear what reality is. She said, okay. Life is a plunger, and we're all pieces of shit. <laughs> you hear that? That's the way she filled in that blank. What kind of life do you think she had, Carol? God, what a bummer. You know? You think your view of reality doesn't affect your behavior? And the lady did. She had a rotten life, and she was depressed a lot, you know? And she was anxious a lot, and Valium was indicated, one of the detours. You see? I make my reality. I live according to what I see. If I see you as friend, my behavior toward you is quite different than if I see you as enemy, etc., etc., etc. And it is I who see you that way. All right. Then this brings up a question. If my behavior is so intimately related to my view of reality, who's responsible for my behavior? That one hurts, doesn't it? Me? That's right. The eminent philosopher Pogo put it very well, folks. I has found the enemy, and he is me. I form my reality. I live according to what I form there. Okay? Now, what does it tell us to? If, uh, suppose, what can I use for reality here? Let's just use this key. Now, what Lisa sees is different than, what's your name? Jerry. Jerry, than what Jerry sees. And that's different uh, than what you see in the green cap. What was your name? Well, it's different than what he sees. It's different from what I see. Every one of us in here sees a piece of that reality. Is that not right? Then what lesson can we learn from this? 
reality's point of view. Another lesson. If I want to know more about what really is, I must relate to you. There is simply no way for me to find out about the fullness of life and reality, okay, without you. There's the magic word, we again. But we egomaniacs believe that our point of view is the only right point of view, and we run around trying to convince everybody else that it is because we're so afraid that it isn't. Any of you know any AA fanatics? <coughs> I was one. I know what they're like. They secretly walk on water. Or try. You see? Any of you know any religious fanatics? Certainly. There are fanatics everywhere. Frightened, egocentric people who are determined that their point of view must be supported by everyone else. So we need each other. Each of us is responsible for his or her own behavior. And we behave according to what we see reality to be. Are you with me so far? Now, we have widely differing viewpoints on what reality is. And yet many people share a common point of view. I ran around with a bunch of people who shared my view of reality. Did you all not do the same thing? I was admitted to a fraternity in college because ostensibly I shared their point of view. I went to the Baptist church and sat next to, next to old Miss Sims because ostensibly I shared her point of view. I fit. And I ran around with Egghead and Junk and Ducky and that bunch that I ran with, you know, crazy names we had for each other. That's calling me Sweet Lips beside then by instead of Pudding Head, by the way. And, and uh, I shared that point of view. Now tell me something. You run around with a drinking or drugging crowd. You share that point of view. You go into treatment or you get sober and you stay sober two weeks and you go back with that crowd and you drink again and it surprises you. Why should it surprise you? And these old uglies around the programs, they change your playgrounds, change your playmates. Well, they don't like my people. It's not that. It's that if you're going to fit, you're going to have to share that point of view. If you share that point of view, you're going to do again what you're doing before. There's no two ways about it. And boy, people differ in their points of view of reality widely. We differ in this room widely in some respects, okay? Philosophically, there are differences. About psychology, there are differences about what human beings are and are not. There are wide differences. We know this. But certain people share common views of reality, essentially common views of reality. Did you know that? We talk about uh, certain religious groups, and they share a common view, and certain philosophical groups, and they share a common view. But there are two other groups of people that share a common view of reality that I never thought of until I really got thinking about this. Healthy people and unhealthy people share a common view of reality. Any of you ever understand healthy people? I mentioned this last night. I just never understood healthy people. I didn't know how to be healthy. I had to have someone to teach me who had had to learn from somebody else, who had had to learn from somebody else. Yes, we do need one another. Let's do a little scenario here. The healthy guy the alarm clock goes off in the morning, and he reaches over, and he cuts it off, and he sits up on the side of the bed, and he's not too happy about getting up, and, you know, he's still a little, little heavy-eyed and everything, but he wipes his eyes and says, oh, well, time to get up. Wish I could sleep longer, but got to go. And he's up off the bed, man. Goes in the bathroom and passes the mirror and sees his image and says, you're not the prettiest thing in the world. <clears throat> but you're not the ugliest one either. I believe you're enough. Whatever comes up today, I think you can handle it. This is the healthy person talking to himself in the mirror. I never understood that. By this time, he is singing, right? It hasn't been up 10 minutes. He's humming a little tune to himself while he, you know, begins to shave. This is the healthy person. And he's talking to himself, dialoguing. He says, uh, got to go to the office today, and you got that job to finish, and Sam's trying to, you know, 
get in your way here. There's always going to be somebody trying to get in your way. Don't let it bother you. Go ahead and do the best you can. It'll be all right. You're going to make mistakes today. It's okay. It's all right. Everybody makes mistakes, he says. you got problems. All of them are not going to be solved by bedtime tonight. But the unsolved ones will not keep you awake. He's humming, singing, shaving, not cutting himself, talking to himself, liking himself. Takes a shower, he's dressed, he's still humming, you know, he's having a good time. Dresses, goes to the door, his wife comes up, and he says, I love you, baby, I'll see you tonight, gotta go, you know. He goes out to the bus of life, which is pulled up to the curb, and heads for the passenger section. You know people like that? You know? What kind of day do you think he had? I mean, he set himself up pretty good for that day, didn't he? Probably came home, had a good day. Probably sleeps good at night. I never did. How about you? Unhealthy guy. Scenario. Alarm clock goes off. He prays. Oh, shit. That's his prayer. Puts on a snooze alarm. Says, I'll sleep till it goes off. It goes off, and he hits it and prays again, right? I can sleep 15 more minutes, he said. Don't really want to get up, and he oversleeps. Wakes up, realizes he's 30 minutes late already, and he's not even out of bed, and he prays again. You got that prayer? Runs to the bathroom, sees himself in the mirror, and almost gags. You ugly. I don't think you can handle it out there today. You got to go to the office, and you got to do that job, and old Sam doesn't want you to do that job, and he's going to stand in your way every chance you get, and he'll probably defeat you, and you're going to lose your job. Problems, he says. You got these problems. He starts thinking about the problems. He's dialoguing with himself, you know, and he, he cuts himself and he prays again. And the problems kind of feed on one another, don't they? Once you let one of them have its run, the other one comes behind it. Before you know, the man hadn't even peed yet, and he's got 473 problems gone, all of them unsolvable. And he said, they're going to run wild today. You can't sleep tonight. You're not going to solve all these problems unless you can find the right solution to every single one of them. It's got to be exactly right. And don't you let anybody know you make mistakes because you're not supposed to, and they'll get you if you do. Now he's bleeding, right? And every time he cuts himself, he prays again. He's already prayed 40 or 50 times, too. See, he's not even out of the bathroom. Jerks on his clothes. They don't match. Runs to the door. His wife comes up. He says, get out the way. I got to go. Runs out the door to the bus of life, which is pulled up to his curb, and goes dead for the driver's seat. What kind of day you think he had? God, that first part of the morning is so important. Maybe that's the reason the big book Alcoholics Anonymous says when it's talking about prayer and meditation, upon awakening, not ten minutes after, upon awakening, it says, we think about the day ahead. Okay? I don't know about you, I can wait 15, 20 minutes in the morning and I'll end up not praying and meditating. I got too many problems and I don't have time. I'm a busy fella, y'all. Too busy to keep an appointment with God. Way too busy. And by noontime, it is flying apart. Any all that way? I know you're not, but you know. <laughs> now, where do we get this point of view? Where does it come from? Because we need to understand that. Y'all have seen me draw this old picture of the mind so many times that you're probably sick of seeing it, and it's really not your mind, but it's a pretty good model. Let's draw it here for a minute. And in the middle of the mind is that window that we look out of and we form opinions about what we see and we put labels on people and places and things, and that's called perception. And my perception of things is the way I see things to be, roughly. All right? Now, when I came into this world, I don't believe I had any opinions. Did you? 
I, I don't think little babies have any opinions. I don't think they put labels on anything. I think a little baby lives in a magic world, y'all. It's the world called we. The window that he looks out of, the perceptive window, it's clear. As a matter of fact, if he moves, something else moves. If he makes a sound, something responds. It's like everything's him, and he is everything. He's real close, you know? He begins to get out of bed at an early age. Oh, and I've got to say this. Ever notice a baby in his crib or her crib? They're always seeking to relate to something or somebody. Don't care what it is. A kid can sit in the crib and play with a leaf for hours. I believe they totally absorb that leaf. They know everything there is to know about that leaf, not intellectually, but in the deeper knowing sense. They don't even know it's a leaf. They just love it, feel it, play around with it, absorb it. But eventually they get out of that crib, you know, and they go crawling across the floor. And maybe this thing here is sitting on the floor. And he crawls into that thing, and he hits his head, and he gets this strange sensation going down right here, right? Up until now, everything has moved when he moved. That didn't move. And he, well, furthermore, he's got this strange sensation down the back of his head over here. Watch a baby. Generally, the baby will back off and hit it again. You ever watch a kid? Kids are a trip, man. They will back off and they hit that thing again. They are determined it's going to move. Everything's moved up to now. That's going to move. And it doesn't move. Now, if you want to know if that baby's going to be an addict of some kind, that's the baby that backs off and hits it seven times trying to move it. And it won't move. And he hears a voice. And the voice says, honey, don't hit your head on the table. It will hurt. It's a table. This sensation is called hurt. I don't like that. Scenario now. Go with me. And he looks at himself and he says, God, you're small. You're so limited. You're not that table. You're not that big thing over there that made that noise that said something about hurt either. And I believe fear sets in real early. He has recognized his separateness. And he begins to say a new word that he's never said before. I. Me. Mine. If you want to test this out, go up to a baby, you know, young one who's sucking on a bottle. Man, they slobber all over everything. You know that. Babies slobber. I expect somebody to come up one day with something called slobber therapy. We've therapy tried every other way, you know, but walk up toward the baby, and the baby sometimes will push that bottle out to you, slobber and all. You know that? Because you're not you. You're part of him. I mean, he's like he's feeding himself. Really. Think. But he's three years old, and he's got him a sucker, and he's licking on him, right? And you walk up to him, and you say, that's a good-looking sucker. Could I please have some of that sucker? He says, it's mine. There's a radical change here, y'all. What was related is separated. <coughs> what was total and complete is now fragmented. <coughs> now, this kid begins to form a system of things that are very important to him. System of what we call values, huh? I'll write it out here. And his values begin to impact on his outlook, on his perceptive window. 
His first value may be, it's important for me not to hit my head on the table because it hurts, right? Let's stay simple. He begins to form a whole system of opinions now. about this world outside himself called beliefs and they begin to color his perceptive window he begins to develop certain definite feeling patterns so that we can look at kids when they're three four years old and say this one's outgoing this one's shy you know this one's angry this one's afraid feelings begin to impact on his outlook on life. All these experiences that he stores up from the word go begin to impact on his point of view, his perception. And now he is looking out of a window which is like stained glass. It's colored. He has a definite outlook. He begins to hang around with people who share that outlook. He begins to argue with those who don't. He behaves in terms of his own values and his own beliefs. He sees the world now through colored glasses. You understand what I'm saying? Is this clear to you? I hope it is. Now, Suppose he looks at reality now, and it is horrible. Suppose life is a plunger, and it's going nowhere. And I'm lost, and I'm alone, and I'm afraid. And I'm empty, and I hurt. And there's an ennui in my life. I need filling. He'll go looking for something. He'll go looking for something that will change his view of reality. Hopefully, it'll change it instantly, y'all. We like instant stuff. Go in your grocery store and look. 
Go to your bookstore and look at the instant books on psychotherapy and on how to get good and how to get well and all, you know, in 10 minutes and get a degree for it. We like instant stuff. Our society, I think, doesn't know how to delay gratification. I'll just say that about the whole society. Delay gratification. That's wonderful, big language, isn't it? This society doesn't know a damn thing about eating Oreos. This society goes right for the creamy center. Never mind the wafers, baby. Let's get with it. <laughs> Listen to the street language. Let's get it on. So we find something that's instant. Maybe it's alcohol. Maybe it's food. But whatever it is, the effect of it is to change reality or to seem to change reality or your point of view of reality. The world which was a plunger changes radically, dramatically, instantaneously, feeling good. That's wonderful, isn't it? That's what they call the elixir of the gods, I guess. Uh, did I share with you last time I was down here about A.E. Houseman, the English poet? Any of you read his poetry? It's nice stuff. It's really good stuff. And, and uh, Houseman was an alcoholic, I know, uh, because I read this poem of his one time, and he couldn't have written it if he wasn't. And he was talking about this change. And let me share this with you. He said, Many a peer of England brews livelier liquor than the muse, and malt does more than Milton can to justify God's ways to man. Ale, man, ails the stuff to drink for fellows whom it hurts to think. Look into the pewter pot and see the world as the world is not. Bingo. It's changed, didn't it? The major reason that I drank and used drugs, and did a lot of other addictive things, was that those things seemed to change reality. Seemed is an important word. They never did. Reality was always worse when I returned. Houseman said that too. Look into the pewter pot and see the world as the world is not, he said, and faith is pleasant till it is past. The mischief is, it will not last. Well, I've been to Ludlow Fair and left my necktie, God knows where, and carried to my home or near pints and quarts of Ludlow beer. And then the world seemed none so bad, and I myself a sterling lad, and down in lovely muck I've lain happy till I woke again. And then I saw the morning sky. Hi-ho, the tale was all a lie. The world, it was the old world yet, and I was I, and my clothes were wet, and nothing now remained to do but begin the game anew. Tell me you wasn't a drunk. Hate to tell you this. I hated to, to discover this. Reality does not change instantly. Oh, God, how I wanted it to. And how you wanted it to. You'd come off a bender, and you'd make these world-shaking statements like, I have learned my lesson this time. <laughs> you hear that? We really meant that. I have learned my lesson this time. We say, I will never do this again. I am finished forever. And I got to tell you what's true of me. Anytime I use the word forever, ever, or never, I'm on an ego trip. That was true then, it's true now. I have learned my lesson. I'm not going to look at it that way anymore. Now, you've been out there building that point of view of reality for how long now? Is it 20 years or 21 years or 25 years or 30 years? And after one bad experience, you're just going to change it all. There's the instant grits again. 
I'll just add a little water here. It'll all change. Instantaneously, painlessly, hopefully. Sorry about that. Your point of view of reality will never change until your values do. What are they? Abraham Maslow talked about a hierarchy of values. There's a system. Patty, they're arranged in order. First value, second value, you know, in order of their importance. In my mind, at some level, is that value system. All of it. If I ask you, honestly now, hell, if I ask me, to write down on a piece of paper your top five values, could you do it? I could probably write down, you know, what I wish they were and what I thought they were. But I doubt if I could do that. So, if we're going to change our point of view and our perception of reality, we must change our values. If we don't know what our values are, we must discover what they are. How do you do that? Look at your behavior. That hurts. That's a dead giveaway. We behave in terms of what's valuable to us. Look at your behavior. Might shake you up. But you discover what your values really are. And then when you discover, as Chuck used to say, you discard. You replace, you reprioritize. But first you've got to know what's there. And then you start moving things around a little bit. And what happens is this. Okay? Now, you will never change your perception unless you change your beliefs. Your opinions about what's right and good and true and real and all these things. Your opinions about this reality thing, right? What are your beliefs? What do you believe? Do you know? Then how do you know? Look at your behavior. Discover, discard, reprioritize, replace. Got those feelings. Any of you ever look at the world through angry eyes? I did for 30 years. The world looks different, doesn't it? Feelings, boy, they hit. They impact so heavily on what reality is for me. Clean them up. That's what the 12 step program says. Clean them up. Learn how to express, get out these feelings. And the beauty of the 12 step program is to suggest that we get them out through service to others. If you look at it very closely, memories. Look at your experiences in life. Instead of damning yourself for having them, learn from them. It's a beautiful section in the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. It begins by saying, now about sex. God, we avoid that topic, don't we? And you know what that whole thing says? Look at your past behavior. See what your values were in your sexuality, huh? Because it's very closely related to spirituality. They are so intimately together that we confuse one from the other often. What's your beliefs been in your sexual life? You know, who have you hurt in your sexual life? The whole thing is, look at it, learn from it. Don't put yourself down. On this side of the paper, you know, what you did, and on this side of the paper, what you've learned that you're going to do now to change. That's the way we learn. 
And so we examine those experiences and learn from them. If you will think, if you've been uh, clean and sober or involved in a 12-step program for any time at all, you know, you probably have realized by now that you learn more or have learned more from your mistakes than from your successes. And it's the transformational process that takes place there, you know. This mistake becomes the foundation, if you will, of my future success. The big book says, our past becomes our most valuable asset. That blew my mind until I understood that. Yeah, it is. This is a transformational process that's happening here. Now, when you have examined these things, when you have learned from these things, when you've cleaned up a little bit, guess what happens to your perceptive window here? It's clear. Like a child's. Unless you become as a little child. Okay? Moving on back. Clearing up the window. And start all over again. With what? These principles which are guides to progress. New priorities. Huh? The new priorities given to you in this program and these principles. It's a funny thing, y'all. The beginning phrase... In the twelfth step. Anybody tell me what it is? Come on. Having had a spiritual awakening. What is that? If it's not a massive change in perception. Would you tell me? What is it? Carl Jung said it was that. Massive shift, he said, in values. Massive shift in attitudes and beliefs. Total change. Okay? So something dies. What? Old values, old beliefs, old feeling patterns. You see? And you really do start all over brand new. Now you're ready to be, if you will, Regenerated. Yeah, made all over again. And we say, oh, oh, that's far out. Anybody sitting in here that's an addict or addicted to anything or is addicted to an addict even? It is strange what people get addicted to. <laughs> and, you know, your addiction hasn't killed you today. You're being regenerated. You're being transformed. If you're a dilated addict, you haven't shot up today. Something's happening to you. Yeah. If you're an alcoholic, you haven't had a drink. Something's happening to you. You see? But you see, in addition to being impatient, wanting instantaneous stuff, we want big stuff. Transform me, Lord, now. Get me on up there with Augustine. It's almost like God comes back and says, Okay, if you're ready to work and wait. It is work. It almost kills some of us. We've got to work at the program in order for it to be a success. And we balk. I'll go this far and no further. What do you mean 90 meetings in 90 days? Oh, I can go. My, my job won't let me do that. What do you mean get a sponsor? I don't want to bother anybody. What an ego trip. <coughs> well, you worked pretty hard to become a drunk. 
and you work pretty hard to become addicted and you think you're going to get over it on a slide you think God is some large fooly bear riding across the clouds on a tricycle I don't think so so you got to work Any of you are familiar with a German philosopher by the name of Friedrich Nietzsche? Nietzsche fell into great disrepute, you know, because Hitler liked him. Uh, Nietzsche died in the nut house when he was 40. You know, what could he know? Have you ever realized some people are too tender for this world? People like Van Gogh and Nietzsche, and we've known some others, too tender for this world. And Nietzsche really took a beating because uh, you heard all the preachers a few years ago and they're yelling about God is dead and God is dead and all this stuff. And you saw the bumper stickers, if he's dead, he died since this morning because I just talked to him and all that kind of, you know, how we get carried away with stuff. Nietzsche was the man who said God is dead. So he's taking a beating. But they never gave Nietzsche his full due. Nietzsche did say God is dead. His love for us has killed him. You know what else he said? He who has a why to work for can put up with any how in order to get there. If your goal is sobriety, And it's strong enough and important enough to you. You'll put up with what it takes. You'll do what it takes to get there. And if it's not, you won't. Okay? Change doesn't just happen. Not real change. Only illusions. Okay? Now, I think we're going to break for just a little bit. It's about what? It's about 2 o'clock. Uh, Jerry, do you want to say something first? Okay. And let's take, I don't know, what do you all want to take? About 10, 15, come on back, and we'll go from there. I want to talk to you a little bit next about uh, uh, maintaining, maintaining things in terms of uh, watching. Uh, if you don't know what that means, maybe I can tell you. All right?